Welcome to Talking Mopars episode number 76. This is something a little bit different because I've never done a live solo podcast before and that's what I did today. Who knows? It could have been a train wreck. Maybe it was a train wreck. I guess there's only one way to find out and that's for you to listen. So without further ado, if you are a Mopar enthusiast, then you are in the right place. Don't go anywhere. You're tuned into the best Mopar enthusiast-driven podcast on planet Earth, and I'm your host, Chris Albrecht, better known as the Mopar Hunter, and this is Talking Mopars Live. You're listening to Talking Mopars with the Mopar Hunter, your direct connection to all things Mopar. Hey guys, I guess we're live. I was just recording episode number 76 of the podcast and I thought to myself, you know, it would be fun to do this live instead and just wing it. So here we are winging it. This is episode number 76. Um, I have a little bit of an outline, but like I said, we're winging it. So I guess, uh, hold on, hold on to your hats. We're just going to see if this is a train wreck or if it's a good time. I think it's going to be a good time. Feel free to join in the chat if you'd like. Um, I can also have people come on the show too. If you have a webcam and headphones or earbuds or even your cell phone camera, we can get you on the show. So if you're feeling a little impulsive like myself, go ahead and uh, send me a message in the chat and we'll see about getting you on. But uh, this is completely impromptu. It was not planned. I have an outline over here for what the show was going to be. So I'm going to kind of go off that a little bit. But um, you guys probably saw my video from earlier today on Facebook about me going to get exhaust on the truck. That was, it was a train wreck. <laughs> I can't wait to tell you about it. Um, we're, I was going to talk about a project car, but I think that would be kind of boring. So let's just talk about good budget friendly project Mopars that are out there right now waiting for you to buy and waiting for you to put in your garage or in your backyard, depending on what kind of situation you have. Um, and for high performance parts, I have noticed that I've been running across a lot of Mopars in music videos. And my friend Bud sent me a suggestion. So we're gonna go over that. And then I'm not gonna try to read stories live. That could that could be a train wreck. So I usually take multiple takes of those because I sometimes punctuation and things like that reading other people's writing is really hard so I'm going to go ahead and I think I have some Google messages so we'll just play some of those I was actually going to read a couple stories for episode number 76 but uh, I think it'll be better to play some messages rather than me read and uh, like I said we'll talk about the Mr. Norm shop truck and what happened with that today. And then the main topic of the podcast was going to be building a Mopar versus buying a Mopar that's already completed or that you can drive and use as a project at the same time. So that's what we're going to do. We're live. So, you know, hold on to your hats. All right. So let's go ahead and kick this thing off the right way. Yeah, this is a this is a new one for me. I've never tried to podcast live. So I see in the chat David says love the Grand Spalding sign, rest in peace Mr. Norm. Yeah, definitely hit hit uh, the Mopar community pretty hard. Um I actually I ordered a bunch of memorabilia um from Norm Jr., Mr. Norm's son and go follow and like and get notifications for that page. It's Mr. Norm's memorabilia. There's only so much left that's actually signed by Mr. Norm. Um, I ordered the sign and I got a nice little Mr. Norm poster and you might not be able to see it, but on my shelf up there, there's a little Mr. Norm's Grand Spalding Dodge uh, magnetic emblem that is on my shelf. Everything that I have is signed by Mr. Norm. 
um, including the license plate that I've had for a while. So I'm happy to have some Mr. Norm memorabilia. And hopefully, I put out a message saying that I wanted to do a tribute episode to Mr. Norm and get messages from people just, you know, saying what you think about Mr. Norm. If you've had an experience with him, you know, in person, maybe you've had a good chat with him, or maybe you know him really well. Um, call my voicemail at 209-28-MOPAR and leave a message. I think it would be really cool to get an episode together and just have a bunch of messages played um, in honor of Mr. Norm. I think that would be really cool. So go ahead and do that. I've been reaching out to some people that are pretty close to Mr. Norm to see if they'd be willing to come on the show for that episode. So I'm working on that right now. So hopefully we can make something happen. But like I said, go give Mr. Norm's memorabilia, the Facebook page, a like, a share, and get notifications because Lee, Norm Jr., uh, goes live all the time. And there's going to be, I think he's going to be either auctioning off or offering up um, signed memorabilia from Mr. Norm's personal collection, which is going to be really cool. So go check out the page and, you know, follow, like, and share. Um, let's get into it. Project Cars are at an all-time high. Uh, they are, the prices of these cars are so ridiculous that it's almost mind-boggling. Now, you don't see me comment a lot on the prices of these cars because it's really not my place, you know, especially since I'm not really in the market right now. Uh, but I see some of these cars and it just, you know, I see all the comments. I wish I could reply to every comment that I see, especially the funny ones, but it's just not, it's just not possible. But there are a lot of funny ones and there's a lot of guys that just love to, they, they think they're appraisers. Um, but what I've been seeing is it's just an upward trend. Uh, every time I see a good deal, it's gone really quick. Recently, a 1970 uh, satellite showed up locally, um, and it was plum crazy purple, uh, or in violet, sorry. <laughs> it was in violet, and it was big block swapped, originally a 318 car, and it was like 9,500 bucks, and it ran and drove. It needed some rust repair, but from the pictures you could see that it still had bucket seats in it and which uh, i'm assuming it was a console car so floor shifter um i wish there was more pictures but by the time i really wanted to take a closer look it was already gone but 9500 bucks i was like i don't care if it's not an original big block car i would have bought it <laughs> you know what i mean so every once in a while you'll get a crazy good deal and you just have to be ready to jump on it. Recently, I had a bunch of money and I was waiting for deals like that, but they just weren't around. And then I spend a bunch of money and buy this truck and now all these deals are coming around. Now, I would have bought the truck anyway, so that's beside the point. But I see a lot of people, they're almost discouraged uh, with the prices of these Mopars. And I understand it. You know, nobody can reasonably buy a 1969 Dodge Charger that's a complete rot box and for $25,000 and then get it to the point where it's roadworthy uh, on a budget. That uh, if you've done it, by all means, share with the world how you did it. Um, that to me is just, it's next to impossible to do it on a budget. You buy a $25,000 rot box and gosh, you could put $25,000 into it and still not be on the road. That might just be for metal work and getting it uh, body and white. <laughs> you know, so not even painted, just the metal work done, and you have a shell. Um, because paint jobs, I mean, a good paint job, I mean, you guys know, what are these paint jobs going for? Good show quality paint jobs, 20 grand. <laughs> you know, I've heard some crazy numbers on materials alone. I've heard crazy numbers, you know, thousands of dollars just on materials. So when you see these cars, I see a lot of people saying, oh, these sellers are out of their minds, yada, yada, yada. Part of me wants to agree. And part of me, you know, I, I'm of the, idea that it's only worth what somebody's willing to pay. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there with deep pockets that see these cars and they see opportunities. So that's kind of what we deal with. But what are some good project cars that are still out there or trucks that you can still have fun with on a budget? You know, first thing that comes to my mind, obviously, is Dodge trucks, whether it be the first generation Rams, the old swept lines, 
or even my favorite, the tin grills, the 72 to 80 Dodge trucks and Plymouth Trail Dusters, Ram Chargers. And those are still pretty reasonably priced. They're coming up though. So if you're interested in one of those trucks, you better jump on them now. Any, any Dodge truck, really. Even the first generation Rams, they're getting crazy, especially the diesels. Anything with the Cummins in it. I've looked at, locally, there's a couple that uh, are diesel trucks and they're going for like 20,000 plus dollars. So that to me is insane. But I do think that there is a large variety of Mopar trucks that you could turn into a great project. Like locally, there's like a 98 Dodge Ram 1500, but it's the SST. So it's got the racing stripes and the 5.9 360. And it's like 2,800 bucks. I think that would make a great project. Um, tin grills, like I said, there's still, some of them are still reasonably priced. Uh, the biggest problem with those is parts. It's, you know, you're pretty much in the used market. You know, I hear the name LMC get tossed around a lot. They don't have much, you know, unless you have a first generation Ram. But first gen Rams are great project trucks and you can still find them for reasonably cheap because they haven't caught on yet like the C10s, mostly because of parts availability. But, um, hey, Braden, what's up, buddy? Hey, Derek. Let's see what Braden says. It's hard enough getting the motors for a decent price, yet, al yet alone finding original parts as well without being an arm and a leg. It's crazy. Dakotas. Yeah, he says Dakota trucks are great, and they are great. I love Dakota RTs, and even, you know, maybe you like 4x4s. Braden likes 4x4s. He's got a mud truck, and you know, those make great projects. Um, so don't discount the Dakotas. Even the uh, the older, I don't, I don't like com this comparison, but the older S10 style Dakotas. Um, those are great. If you can, I, in Portland, I think there was recently a uh, Shelby Dakota for like two grand, <laughs> you know, so that would have been cool. Um, speaking of Shelby, as you may or may not know, I'm a big fan of the Turbo Mopars. I, and Mopar literature. So I just picked up a bunch of cool stuff. I got the Direct Connection, uh, Carol Shelby chassis, uh, Speed Secrets, Direct Connection. Super good condition. I got that. I got Carol Shelby Speed Secrets, the engine book, another Direct Connections book. Very cool. Check that out. <laughs> Chrysler Wedge. What's on the back of this one? Sweet. Yeah, that's rad. And then, uh, of course, Turbo Mopar stuff. 2.2 front wheel drive, Carol Shelby's Speed Secrets for engine and chassis modifications, direct connection. Oh, look at that. Non-turbo carbureted single overhead cam, four cylinder. Um, God, that's cool. It's even got the uh, direct connection oil filter, the direct connection valve cover. You know how rare that is? I think those are, yeah, those are uh, direct connection. Um, I don't know if it's the whole carb, but definitely the filters. That's very cool. I haven't even really peeked into these yet. Um, I just I just uh, unwrapped them like 20 minutes ago. And then I got the service manual for my truck just because I, I just like having a lot of documentation and uh, literature is what I meant to say. Uh, literature is cool. I like old car magazines and stuff too, but getting back to the trucks, don't count out Mopar trucks as great projects. You've heard me many times on the podcast say that you can build an engine and then wait for your dream Mopar to come around. And until then, just throw it in a truck, you know? So Derek says 81 to 93 trucks are where it's at. I, I don't disagree. I'm a tin grill guy, but I definitely see the value in picking up a reasonably priced first gen Ram. Um, you know, and there's a lot still out there as far as, you know, what do you want? You want a, a long bed? You want a short bed? You want four wheel drive, two wheel drive? There are plenty of options and some of them are still reasonably priced. Like I said, they really haven't caught on like the C10s, which is good for us. So definitely don't count out the project trucks. Um, C bodies are another good project that you could get for reasonably cheap. I see a lot of C bodies out there. You know, a lot of people don't like the four-door sedans, but something 
I don't know. There's something about a big body four door sedan with a big block in it that, you know, gets me going. <laughs> um, I think they're cool. Uh, definitely another sector of Mopars that I think are counted out far too often. And I know that's almost insulting to my sea body friends, but it's it's really not. I think you guys are in a great position because someday when people realize that they're never going to be able to buy these $20,000 chargers because not everybody's Johnny Mopar and getting them for a hundred bucks in 1990. <laughs> you know what I mean? So don't count out sea bodies. There's a lot of them that are big blocks and um, tons of small block sea bodies out there. So, you know, the, the options are pretty limitless, you know, especially if you're just, if you're just in the market for something to throw an engine in and have some, clean cheap fun uh shows like roadkill you know they're building piles of junk you know and i say that with love <laughs> and people are eating it up because it's like the everyman stuff you know not every like you watch these shows on tv and i hear this a lot so you know forgive me if i'm beating a dead horse but you see these guys on tv buy these crazy cars and you see them in one episode or two episodes flip an entire car do a full restoration now, in some situations, those shows actually do pull it off, but that's why a lot of them end up um, being canceled because you cannot <laughs> burn the candle at both ends for that long before it eventually catches up to you and your employees get pissed <laughs> and they're wore out. And, you know, I think that those TV shows give people a false idea of one, what these cars are worth, two, how easy projects can be. You know, they make it look so easy when in reality it's not. Um, that's one reason why I let my Dart and my other D100 go. Um, I was just in over my head. And uh, when I think about it now, it's the best thing I've ever done, you know, because it got me the Mr. Norm Tribute truck. So definitely a lot of Mopar projects out there that are still budget friendly and, you know, plentiful. Um, a bodies. I recently just saw 70 duster four speed 318 car for like 1400 bucks the quarters were you know the bottom of the quarters were rusted out but gosh you know four speed duster for like 1400 bucks um i really wish i had reached out because i i think you could have gotten that car for a little cheaper but um you know it just you got to be ready you know now i'm smart enough to have a couple grand just sitting to the side just in case something crazy comes along because there's been so many times where a good deal like that duster has come along and you know if you don't act first you don't get it and after thinking about it for a couple of days i was like yeah i'm gonna call on it sure as anything it was gone so definitely be ready so you don't have to get ready and if you see something that you just call you know get some information um that duster it's not gonna haunt me but Knowing that I let a four-speed duster for less than two grand go like that when it was pretty complete, I mean, it didn't need very much to get on the road. Um, that one kind of that one kind of stings a little bit, but there's still plenty of Mopar projects out there to be had. So don't get discouraged when you see you know Roadrunners and Chargers and Challengers and Cudas going for crazy absurd amounts of money. Um, there, every once in a while, one pops up for cheap. And there are some that are cheap out there, but you're pretty much getting a shell and they need a lot of metal work. So if you're good with a welder, then, you know, get to it. <laughs> I know there's a couple challengers that I've seen recently for like four or five grand that uh, come with a bunch of spare metal. And, you know, if you have the means and the skills, not a bad idea to pick one of those up because you can build it how you want. Um, I recently, before I got my truck, I went to a bunch of Mopars locally that I know of because I had a pocket full of cash and I wanted to spend it. I wanted to buy a Mopar. And there was a 70 Challenger that I've known about for, gosh, probably a year or two now. And I went over there just to finally figure out what this car was all about. It was an A66 and a four-speed car, 340 um, rally wheels, but it was a complete project, completely torn down. And I talked to the guy, he was nice enough, but when I asked him, you know, how much, how much for the Challenger, uh, he goes, without, without hesitation, he looks me dead in the eye 
and says 30 grand. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. Now, if it was fully restored or at least in running driving condition, you know, maybe, maybe you're in that ballpark, you know, 20 grand maybe um, for something that runs and drives, but maybe is uh, still a project. But this car with, I mean, he's telling me, yeah, I got all the parts there in boxes and whatnot. And I'm just like, 30 grand, dude. <laughs> but uh, he knows what he has. And maybe he has a sentimental attachment to the car and he doesn't want to let it go for any less than $30,000, which, you know, that's, that's up to him. You know, maybe somebody who had a car like that in high school wants one bad enough and they got deep pockets. Who knows? But um, cars like that, they're the ones that kind of annoy you because it's like, gosh, you know, how long has the car been sitting there, dude? And you're not doing anything with it and it's just rotting away and you've got everything in boxes and then you could potentially sell it today. You know, I offered him $17,000 cash right there on the spot. And he uh, almost laughed in my face. And I was like, all right, buddy. Um, so we'll see. We'll see if anyone ever gives him 30 grand. But I'm almost willing to bet that in five years, that car is still going to be there. It may have a new car cover on it, but I bet it'll be in the same spot. Because my friend Adam from work is the guy who told me about it because it's on his route. And I think he said the car's been there for like four or five years. So that's crazy to me that the guy hasn't done anything in it, uh, to it in four to five years. And it's, and the car is what it is, you know, an A66 package challenger. That's mind boggling to me. Now I had a 76 D100 and a 69 Dodge Dart that sat for years, <laughs> you know, so I can't talk too much, but if I had a challenger that was that cool, I would probably be a little bit more motivated to get it on the road. Um, but moving on, you know, there's still a lot of good projects out there. Just be ready. Um, high performance parts. If you don't listen to Talking Mopars, um, and for those that are going to be listening to this later, uh, this is live on Facebook right now. So this really isn't for you because if you're listening to the show, then you probably listen to other episodes and you know that high performance parts is a segment of the show where... I briefly discuss a Mopar from TV, uh, movies, or lately music videos. I've been running across a lot of Mopars and music videos. And my friend Bud sent me a suggestion for high performance parts. He said, hey, in the song 1979 by the Smashing Pumpkins, there's a charger. I think it was a 72 charger. I'm going to have to look through my Facebook messages right now. I think he said it was a 72 charger um in like i forget what color green but he said it was green let's see here let's actually get to google too i'm going to share my screen we're going to go to google because if it is a music video then i want to see the car so let's see here hold on a second folks the smashing pumpkins 1979 there it is let's see and i'll share my screen in a minute once i get a video pulled up here okay all right let's see what he says first let's see if i can find it yeah here we go he said uh can't remember if you've covered this one or if music videos count but this could be a high performance parts candidate maybe it's a 1972 challenge challenger 1972 Charger looks to be F7 Sherwood Green with green interior and a white canopy top. Let's check it out. And yeah, music video cars are definitely great candidates. So let's see what this is all about here. I'm going to put you guys over here and share the screen. Okay. I don't know if I could get in trouble for playing this, but we're we're discussing it. So I whoa. Hold on, folks. That is awfully loud. I apologize. <laughs> I don't even know if you guys can hear or see this. 
and there's eight of you watching. So if anybody wants to jump on the chat and tell me if you can actually hear this or not, that would help me. Well, let's see if we can find this car. Oh, hold on. There it is. Oh, yeah, look at that. Ooh, very cool. Yeah, look at that. No rally gauge package. That sucks. <laughs> Very cool car. Now, these chargers are affordable. <laughs> you can still get these things. Yeah, look at that. You guys are probably like, oh, I hate the Smashing Pumpkins. <laughs> I don't, I, I actually like uh, the Smashing Pumpkins. Yeah, that's a nice car. I like that color. I, I'm such a fan of greens. You know, for a while I was, I was dead set on F8 green, but this uh, RJ3 Citroen Metallic um, on my truck is amazing. But all right, yeah, there it is. Whoops. Yeah, it's always fun to see Mopars in music videos. And I know there's a lot of them out there. I got to hunt them down. So if you guys know of Mopars in music videos, send them to me. Um, send me the suggestions. You can reach me on Facebook Messenger or um, email me, Chris, at TalkingMopars.com. Or you could actually even call the voice message or the voicemail and uh, let me know that way. That way I don't have to talk about it and you can tell me all about it. <laughs> all right, I think that might be the last of the car. Oh, maybe a little bit more. This is probably really boring for those of you that are listening. But if you want to follow along, the Smashing Pumpkins 1979. The music video, the car is pretty much throughout the whole thing. Um, it has appearances. But yeah, neat car. I, you know, I, a lot of people don't give the fuselage body styles the respect they deserve. And I think that they make some of the cooler street machines. That's just my opinion. Definitely a 72 Charger. Very cool. Doesn't have the hideaway headlights. All right. And it appears that I didn't even share the screen. <laughs> let's, let's do this again, folks. Hold on. Okay. I don't even know if you guys saw any of that. So I don't think you did. Hey, Rick, what's up? Braden, thank you. And Derek, thank you. I wish I was paying attention to what you guys were saying. <laughs> I knew this was going to be a train wreck. <laughs> uh, this is the first time I've actually done a podcast live. I just thought I was just really impulsive. <laughs> I've been really impulsive lately. God, I hate these ads. Can you guys hear it now? Oh, this is wrong video. Damn it. Hold on. Okay. Ah, stupid ad. I don't want to hear it. Come on. People listening to this are like, get on with it. <laughs> okay. Let's try this again. I hope I'm not blowing your eardrums out, guys. If I am, I apologize. The car is coming up here in a few seconds. He's in it right now. There it is. F7. Looks like green interior. See, like I said, these things make cool street machines. This one really isn't a street machine. Um, but uh, jack it up, put some fat meats in the back. All right. Yeah, it does have that white canopy top. Like I said, no rally gauges though. And that's every time I see one of these B bodies and it doesn't have the rally gauges, it pisses me off. <laughs> okay, we don't need to watch the whole video again. Let's just see the car.
Again, for those of you listening, the Smashing Pumpkins, the song is called 1979. And there's a 72 charger in it. Is this the most boring podcast ever? <laughs> I want to, I know there's a website. I've used it a couple times. Oops, the hell am I doing? All right, that's not for that. Stop sharing screen. <clears throat> uh, there's a website. It's called ICMDB or something like that. And uh, it's all movie cars. And trucks. You can look up pretty much any car and see, you know, what movie um, had what car in it. Uh, I've used it maybe once or twice, but I'm going to start compiling a list of Mopars. Um, okay, Braden, don't worry. I think most people uh, most people probably didn't want to hear the Smashing Pumpkins anyway. <laughs> I actually like the song. But I know that uh, music is one of those things, much like Mopars, everybody's got their own opinion. But if you're interested to see the car, 1979, the Smashing Pumpkins. So that was high performance parts. Um, and like I said, high performance parts isn't limited to just cars in movies and on TV. Uh, music videos count too. So, and com commercials. I, I saw Liberty Mutual, I think it was, they have a, a yellow duster in the commercial. Um, so that'll probably be a high performance part someday. Uh, listener stories. Today it's going to be messages. Hopefully you guys will be able to hear this. Um, I've never really thought about playing it through the screen, but because you guys couldn't hear the music video I just played, I think we're going to just pull it up on my phone. How long have we been going? Half an hour. Or Okay. Uh, <laughs> Our old buddy Tad is back. So we've got two, two people that have called in. Um, one is Tad. He's the gentleman. Hey, Tad, how's it going? That holds the record <laughs> for most messages ever sent to me. He usually sends them in blocks. So this will be fun. I've, I haven't listened to these yet. And they're all transcribed, so I can see like the first part of them. But uh, <laughs> I don't know what he's going to say in these folks. So hopefully, uh, hopefully nothing crazy. All right. Here is Tad's first message. Now, Tad, um, like I said, he's got the record for most messages sent to me. He's got a Super B that he's restoring, and he sends me pictures, which I probably should share with you guys. It is an amazing car. He's doing a really phenomenal job with it. So, Tad, keep up the good work, buddy. Here is Tad's message, the first one. <laughs> hey, Chris, it's Tad. Uh, I just wanted to call in, just uh, listening to the newest podcast, um, getting my, getting my uh, advice for buying a car from you. Um, anyway, I wanted to call in uh, two things. Number one, I think I'll call in every week. There needs to be a new segment of the show called Tad's Two Cents. I think that'd be a good, a good addition. I think you're right. <laughs> um, the other thing is, you know, about being busy and man, I, I, I thought about what you said in terms of work and family and projects and then also doing a podcast. And, like, I, we have a pretty similar busy life for me, minus the podcast. So I, I and you find time to do that and get it out. I really appreciate it. I know other people do. Um, maybe you need a sidekick. I mean, the Lone Ranger had Tondo. Smokey had the Bandit. Bo had Luke. Man, I think you need a sidekick to help you, uh, you know, getting bigger. And, and, you know, you're getting out there more. You need someone uh, next to you to help you get these things done or at least part, get part of the, the editing and all that stuff done. So anyway, you know, if you take an application, let me know. Um, I think the other thing I was thinking. Tad, this is an open forum for these lives. Anybody can come on my show. I'm not, I'm not the guy who's like only superstars and celebrities. I mean, how many celebrities are in the world of Mopar, really? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, 
so when I do lives, if you guys want to come on the show, tell a story, you know, I, these are meant to be fun and hopefully entertaining. Um, as far as sidekicks go, Johnny Mopar was essentially my first sidekick. Uh, and I don't even like using that word. He's a friend of mine. And he was really, it was really fun hearing his stories that when he was calling in and we actually had him on the show and then it just slowly developed. Now we do these lives with um, the Direct Connections live episodes with a bunch of my friends. Braden's been there. Um, Johnny Mopar, Blake from DIY Hemi, Matt from Mad Pro Monroe on Big Blocks Garage. Uh, gosh, I mean, so many people. Um, and then not to mention the chat. You know, I love the participation in the chat. I wish I could just sit here and talk to you guys through the chat, but I don't know how fun that would be. But uh, hey, thanks, Braden. <laughs> Sometimes I, I find myself boring. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I figure this is a good way for the people that have been following the Mopar Hunter for so long to get to know me because they see my posts every day. And for such a long time, I was just hiding behind the keyboard, just doing the posts and every once in a while commenting and stuff. But, uh, you know, I thought this would be a better way to connect and get people uh, to participate, you know, a little bit more like in the chats that are live or even come on the show. I thought that would be fun. So that's, that's why I'm doing more video now. And it's only going to get uh, it's only going to get bigger as far as the videos I do and stuff like that. So, uh, look forward to that. Uh, Braden says, dig those direct connection pro form parts valve covers. Yeah. Uh, I just got some direct connection Chrome valve covers for my 360 in the Mr. Norm shop truck because the stock ones are leaking like stuck pigs. <laughs> so I thought maybe I, I just, you know, change the valve covers and I love direct connection stuff. Um, if I'm on eBay, if I go on eBay before I even look at cars, you know what I type in? I type in direct connection because I like, I like all the, uh, the NOS parts and stuff, but, uh, those, uh, valve covers from pro form parts are really high quality. So high quality. In fact, that along with them, I bought, uh, Mr. Gasket dress up kit for the 360 to see, and it came with valve covers to see what the quality difference was. And because I now have this GoPro, I'm going to start doing um, like review videos and stuff. So the first video I'm probably going to do, like as far as like uh, parts go, <laughs> is going to be, and who knows if it's going to be good or not, but uh, I was going to do a Pro form direct connection uh, repop valve cover versus a Mr. Gasket valve cover, and just see which one um, which one's better. I thought that would be kind of cool. So more of those videos are coming. Um, I got to get used to this GoPro. Uh, podcasting took me a while before I even started the podcast. I did a lot of research on how to do it because I didn't want it to be a complete train wreck. <laughs> and now I go back and I listen to old episodes every once in a while when I feel like when I want to hear how the show has progressed, because sometimes I need a reminder. So I'll jump on one of the old episodes really quick and just listen to five minutes of it. And the sound quality alone, <laughs> I'm like, gosh, I hope, I hope people don't listen to the first few episodes and go, gosh, <laughs> this does not sound good. Um, at the time there was a lot of reverb in the office I was recording in. And now, as you can see, I have some um, acoustic treatment up on my walls and believe it or not, the little bit that I have has helped tremendously in deadening some of that reverb that I was getting in the room downstairs. Um, so anyway, enough boring talk. Let's get back to Tad. Sorry, Tad. About two with your with your last message in relation to my my uh, call in last time and the guy from Australia. Like dude, that's you 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 appreciate us being real with you. But I appreciate you being real on your podcast. I mean, that's the thing with a lot of these podcasts and car shows and everything else. Like, they, they set this standard that's so, like, unreal. It's like, then you start to think that you have to, to meet this standard. That Sorry to interrupt again. I swear to God, 
that I did not listen to any of these. I didn't even read the transcripts. Um, we were just talking about this and the <laughs> unrealistic expectations um, from those shows. Continue. So when you call the voicemail, and Braden, I saw your message. I, I know you work with Proform. Um, the next time you talk to him, tell him I love the valve covers. <laughs> I'm actually going to tag them in a post because um, they're awesome. Um, but if you call in to Talking Mopars to leave a voice message for me to share on the show, you only have three minutes, but that's just the first message. You can always call back, and I'll splice them together. This situation is live, so uh, obviously I'm not going to splice them together. I'm just going to play them back to back. So that was the first message I got from Tad. And let's see here. This is the next one. Uh, what I was saying is uh, you started this podcast. I mean, you, you started the process, and now you have this podcast. It's like kicking butt, man. I mean, it's, it's successful. So Thanks, Tad. Projects are kind of the same way you start you get to uh, that part where you get to get in the car and drive it. Um, so yeah, man, I, I appreciate everything you're doing. You're definitely juggling a lot of balls. Um, and uh, yeah, you're keeping them in the air. So anyway, I appreciate the podcast. Hey, in relation to uh, being real, I mean, I'm thinking about it while... Tad, let's watch the language, okay? This is a family show. No talking about juggling balls. All right, buddy? <laughs> going to die perfect live podcast great totally make these but it's not going to be date correct foam rubber you know it's like stupid stuff like that finally i'm just like i'm going to do this like i want to because it's my car so uh anyway you're doing your podcast like you want to i appreciate it it's real and uh i appreciate you being open to real feedback as well man all right i'll uh, not take up any more of your time again pass two cents and uh, you need a sidekick, man. All right, we'll talk to you later, Chris. Tad, I'm going to have to get you on the show. Um, you've contributed a lot to it. So we'll work something out, buddy. Um, we'll have to get you on a live or something, something fun. Um, <laughs> Tad's got two more messages. So, gosh, I didn't realize it's been so long since I've played messages. These were from January 26th. The next one is from February 18th. And the one after that was from um, this most recent Sunday. So let's play his next one from the 18th. Now we also have one from Grant um, who sent his in on February 4th. We're going to play that after Tad's. So this is the second message Tad sent me. 
the second block. Okay, Let's see here. Like I said, folks, I swear to God, I didn't listen to this. So he finds a van <laughs> at a house that he's thinking about buying, and he's looking at trucks. See, this is a guy with a Super V, folks, a car that most of us, myself included, will be like, all right, I don't need anything else. I'm good for now, <laughs> you know? So um, and vans, too. How could I brush over vans? Folks, I've been seeing this a lot lately. Vans are coming back. I know that there's still... A swarm of people that are like, no, no Chester molester vans, no creeper vans. Hey, they're boogie vans, okay? <laughs> um, I'm getting one this month for my birthday. The 20th of March, I'm going to go on a road trip. I'm bringing the GoPro. I'm bringing a buddy with me, and we're going to go meet up with my friend Stacy and pick up a van. Um, I don't know how many people I've shown the van to. Not very many. I wanted it to be a fun surprise. Um, but we'll, we'll talk more about that later this month, but, uh, yeah, vans are, vans are cool. They are coming up in price. I cannot believe the prices of some of these vans, but every once in a while you run across one that's really cheap. Um, but some of them have rust problems and, you know, that can be a deterrent for some people. For me, I just want a van. I'll take whatever I can get at this point, as long as it's not a complete rot box. I'll take what I can get, especially for the price that I'm getting it at. But uh, yeah, uh, if you're even remotely thinking about possibly getting a van someday as a project, get it now. Because there's still, some of them are still reasonable. <laughs> Tad said Knights of the Round Table. That's funny. We actually prefer Mopar Brain Trust. <laughs> That's myself, Johnny Mopar, Matt Monroe, also known as Big Block, and our friend Blake from DIY Hemi. Um, I don't know why, but we are like, it's weird when you get people that you meet on the internet that have a passion for something like Mopars. You just become friends really quick. And same goes for a lot of people, Braden, friends with Braden. Um, Derek, friends with Derek, uh, so many people that I've met 
through Mopar's online that it it just blows my mind because I talk to some of these guys and it's like I feel like I know them <laughs> like uh like in real life you know and it's real life that we're talking but you know what I mean um it's just a lot of my friends in my personal everyday life are not hardcore Mopar people some of them are I have I have some friends but not like not my close close friends you know what I mean I'm the only crazy Mopar lunatic like <laughs> my friend Chad gets a boat from his uncle and I'm looking at it and the first thing I see is the steering wheel and I go holy sh that's a a roadrunner steering wheel or a sport a Mopar sport wheel like I'll even show you guys the picture uh i saw so i reached out to him i was like dude you know what kind of steering wheel that is <laughs> let me see if i can find it anyways <laughs> i won't waste your guys's time so i see the wheel and he's like really and i was like yeah so i i just googled um roadrunner sport wheel and i sent it to him and he goes yeah, that's the wheel and i was like yeah if you ever are interested in getting rid of it let me know because when i had my dart i was looking for one but they're so expensive I was like, <laughs> how expensive are st steering wheels are expensive? What? I mean, what what universe are we living in? You know, uh, so I, I told him, I was like, if you ever want to get rid of that steering wheel, let me know, because I would love to take it off your hands and I wouldn't sell it or anything. It's just a really cool steering wheel. Um, but uh, at first he was like, I really don't care about the steering wheel. I, I'm just not getting rid of the boat. And I was like, uh, I'm going to try to get the steering wheel. And then I was like, no, nah, man, that's part of the boat. Your uncle put that on the boat for a reason. You know what I mean? And it's funny because if you look at the shape of this boat, it almost looks like a roadrunner's head. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if that was like intentional or what. But um, I just thought it was really funny, uh, the steering wheel he had on there. Let me see if I can. I really want to show you guys just because it's cool. <laughs> Here we go. See if you can see that. What's that, guys? First thing I noticed. <laughs> it's got a weird uh, center cap on it, but uh, or horn button where the horn would be. But it's definitely a Mopar steering wheel. Um, here's the actual picture. Like I said, it look. I know it doesn't look exactly like it, but it kind of looks. It kind of looks like a Roadrunner head. You know what I mean? <laughs> But yeah, so definitely a Mopar steering wheel. So I told him, hey, first dibs on that thing if you decide you want something different. Um, I even offered to pay him the same price as a Repop one. You know what I mean? Braden says he works closely. I, th I think we already talked about that. Braden works really closely with uh, Proform. Um, seems like they're a good company. I've never talked to anybody from them. But um, <laughs> Braden says shag wagon and shag carpet, LOL. Yeah, buddy, fun times. I didn't grow up during those times, obviously. Look how young I look. <laughs> but uh, I've definitely heard stories from my dad, from my mom, and uh, just knowing what the two percenter van culture was like. Uh, like I, <laughs> I went on eBay a few months back because I was obviously still really heavy into vans, and I actually bought um, some van magazines just to kind of you know, I don't know why I just love the old literature. Um, maybe it's because I didn't get to grow up in those times. So studying them and um, looking at stuff from that time period is just really interesting to me and really cool. So I got these van magazines and I'm looking at some of the pictures and coverage of these truck-ins is what they call them or van fairs. Um, <laughs> they are insane. Like you think Sturgis for bikes is crazy. These truckins where all these banners went. I mean, some insane times. Like I think about it and I'm like, God, it's almost a good thing I didn't grow up in those times because I probably would have been crazy. <laughs> but uh yeah, vans, 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 vans. And even Freiburger from um Hot Rod magazine, Roadkill. Uh, Dave Freiberger said, uh, vans are coming back. So I wanted to say, hey, I've been into them for a little bit. You know, I'm pretty sure I was conceived in one. Too much information. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but 
uh, I've been around custom vans a very long time as far as my young life. And I'm still trying to hunt down my dad's van. I swear to God, if I ever find that van, I'm buying it. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure it's long gone though. But uh, anyway, back to the messages here. Tad's got one more. And I appreciate what you're saying, Tad. I, with the show, with the podcast, and with these lives, I mean, what you see is what you get, folks. I don't try to BS anybody. I'm myself. If you don't like me, then I don't know what to tell you because I'm me. So, um, yeah, I understand where he's coming from, where it seems like some podcasts are more contrived or more scripted. Uh, mine is mine is edited. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to act like I, t I one take my podcasts. I have to edit them heavily because some things that I say should not be played on the air, you know, for whatever reason. And I do have a mouth like a sailor and I try to watch it most of the time, <laughs> but sometimes it doesn't go as planned. Um, but yeah, I try to be as real as possible and as authentic as possible on these things so that you guys actually get to know me and who I am. Um, but here's, here's Tad's last message. Let's see what he has to say. Yeah. Whoa. So I make a deal with this guy to get. This is going to be a good one. We've heard a lot of Tad's messages, and none of them started like that. <laughs> uh, I, I'm kind of putting you on blast here, Tad, on a live podcast. So <laughs> I don't, like I said, I have not listened to these or even read the transcripts yet. So I have no idea. The D200 two weeks ago, his, his part was to get everything together thing ready to go when I show up so over the last two days I get the money I fucking go down and get my U-Haul pickup truck and my U-Haul trailer drive an hour and a half to this fucker's house and yeah he's got the whole family there I'm loading shit out of it I walk up and he starts right away making excuses about why he doesn't have things and now now all of a sudden the box that had the door handles and the window cranks and everything in it it was in his garage when I was there two weeks ago. Now, now, he says, well, that's the one box that I couldn't find a long time ago when I was going to put things back together. Fucking guy. Then, it gets better. So I asked him if he has a title. He says, oh, yeah, 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 I got the title. It's my house. Um, what, what I was going to do is help you get it loaded up, and then I'll go get the title. I was like, okay. Well, it's in this suitcase with my other title, and I, I can't find that suitcase. I fucking just, the shit got deeper and deeper. Uh, I made a, a phone call to my buddy because I was just pissed to ask his opinion. So I go back and offer him a deal. I say, how about this? I'm here now. I'll load the truck up and take it right now. And I'll give you no money. I'll give you 30 days to write a contract out. Give you 30 days to find the title and all the shit that goes with the truck. And you bring it to me in 30 days. And if you don't bring it to me, the truck is mine, or you can bring a trailer to my house and pick it up. And he just fucking made all kinds of excuses. So long story short, no truck for Tad. And I just fucking rented a U-Haul and a trailer for 160 bucks. That's with all the mileage to go for a joy ride down the 91 freeway in LA, which sucks. So there's my story, Chris. Hope things are going better for you. <laughs> Talk to you later. Wow. <laughs> Gosh, where do I begin? So it must have been a few weeks ago now. I went to go look at a a tin grill Dodge truck. And I talked about it on one of the recent podcasts. And it was a whole fiasco with the VIN on the door and the VIN on the cab, not matching the title and the guy going, Oh, I, let me go find the right title. It just, that kind of shit is absolutely ridiculous. Tad, I feel you. I feel for you, buddy. Um, I know exactly what it's like to rent a U-Haul for over a hundred bucks and waste your time. Uh, sellers get your shit together. Pardon my French, but, uh, that kind of stuff, pisses me off. 
I just can't believe that that kind of stuff still happens. But I guess there's some shitty people out there. You know, it's unfortunate that not everybody deals on the up and up. You know what I mean? Not everybody's honest. And that's a problem. You know, like recently, and I feel super bad about this. I'm still trying to figure out a way to make it right. I, uh, I had a 318 and a 904 that was going to go in my dart when I still had it while the big block was being built because I was getting really impatient. And I just wanted to get the dart on the road. And well, the dart's gone now and I have been liquidating all my parts, trying to break even on everything. And, you know, some parts I've had to sell for cheaper. Some parts I've sold for a little bit higher just to even everything out. Well, I had this 318 and 904. I sold it to this gentleman, um, super nice guy. He runs a, for Washington people, he runs um, a Facebook page called Remembering Arlington Drag Strip. Because we have an airport up here in the city of Arlington, Washington, that they used to have drag races. And according to this gentleman, it actually was a record holding track for a while, which is crazy because I have friends that live right next door to that airport. And I didn't know about the drag strip until, you know, within a couple years ago. And this guy runs a page that documents the history of it. So I thought that was pretty cool, but he came originally to buy a cam, a new cam that I had bought for the 318 that I never used. And he saw the 318 and he said, you know, it looks good. I'll take it. Now this is hundred percent honest. I haven't so much, uh, I got the engine, brought it home, set it on this little dolly that I have, and I have not touched it. The only thing I have done is set an intake manifold and carb on top of it. I'm like, it, it still had an intake on it, too. Bar the only thing I've done is just set parts on top of it just to get them out of my way for a minute. I have never cracked it open. I've never taken the covers off. It didn't concern me because I wasn't even close to putting it in the car yet. And, you know, I didn't even see if it turned. I didn't know if it turned. I put it up for what I thought was, in a, was a reasonable price. And he bought it without even checking it. And I didn't really think anything of it because I assumed that it was good. Um, but thinking back on it now, just the condition of the intake manifold probably should have thrown a red flag to me and the guy who bought it, you know, because he reaches out to me and tells me, hey, there was water in um, cylinders. Oh, what cylinders had water? Uh, I think four and four and I, for, I forget which cylinders, but any, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, two of the cylinders had water inside and rust. And, uh, you know, he basically said, Hey, I'm not, I'm not complaining. You know, I'm not asking for my money back. I just wanted to let you know that that was the condition of the engine. So I was like, man, I'm sorry, dude. I had no idea. And he's like, Hey, that's the risk I took. I, I took a risk buying it. That's my fault basically is what he said. And I, I still feel bad about it. So I'm actually looking for, um, a 318 to help him out. <laughs> uh, but I've come up unsuccessful so far. So if you buy an engine, you know, you maybe want to check it out or ask the guy. If he had asked me, I would have been honest. I would have said, I haven't touched it. <laughs> if you want it, by all means, look at it as much as you want and hell, make me an offer. <laughs> you know what I mean? He didn't even make me an offer. He just bought it. So, but I did, I did give him a really good deal on the cam um, and the lifters and stuff. So that's, that's the story about that. But, uh, you know, I felt bad and I was completely honest. You know, when he asked me what the engine was all about, I said it was intended for a car that I don't have anymore. So it's just taking up space right now. It's a paperweight to me. Um, so he took it off my hands and I wasn't going to stop him. The only thing that he requested is that I pop the transmission off the engine, which I did. And everything looked good. You know, a little, a little surface rust. Um, I was not expecting. And when I got the engine, it had all the holes plugged, you know, were they plugged the greatest? Probably not. You know, they had shop towels or whatever shoved inside uh, the intake and various other orifices <laughs> and duct tape over them. 
So, I mean, I had assumed because I, the guy I got it from super cool guy and you know, I trust him and he, I don't think he screwed me over at all. Um, the engine was just sitting there and he had no use for it. It was a paperweight to him too. So I took it off his hands, um, with the intentions of putting it in my dart. Like I said, no dart, no need for a 318. So I'm going to try to make it right with him, but you know, every once in a while you run across these shady people selling parts or cars and you just have to do your due diligence folks um i used to hear from some of my friends in the car business that buyers are liars <laughs> okay uh i i couldn't disagree more sellers are mostly the liars <laughs> from what i've seen you know what i mean um but yeah you just have to you know if somebody says an engine's been rebuilt or you know i looked at a vehicle recently that the guy was telling me about all these parts inside the engine and if you don't have receipts then we're going to go ahead and assume that it's stock because if you don't have receipts or machine paperwork or anything like that then all you have is words <laughs> you know what i mean if you say it's a if the guy has a 360 powered, I don't know, truck like mine, let's say I'll look at a 78 D 150. It's a 360 and he goes, it's a 408 stroker. Please tell me how you can tell if it's a 408 by looking at it. Go ahead. I'll wait. Um, educate me. Cause as far as I know, you can't. <laughs> so when somebody tells you that kind of stuff, it's like, unless you got paperwork, we're, we just have to assume that you know, and you don't want to call him a liar, but you got to go, hey, I mean, do you have proof? <laughs> you know, I mean, so that kind of stuff, definitely. Um, it's called due diligence. Do your due diligence, you know. Um, so that was, uh, gosh, Tad, that was, I mean, for those of you that listen to the show, you've heard Tad's messages in the past. Super nice guy. And I'm not saying he was being mean there, but you can tell he was pissed and I agree with him. <laughs> I'd be super pissed too. That's, that's a really messed up situation. Um, sorry that happened, buddy. Um, God, what, that's so messed up. Okay. Our last, our final message is from Grant. Let's hear what Grant has to say. Ah, an old caller. This is Grant from Iowa. Hey, Chris, this is Grant calling to you from Iowa again. Uh, I've been listening to the last couple episodes of the podcast while working on my pickup, uh, my 86 W150. Getting married here in July, and sometimes I want to get running for that. Um, hopefully, if I can keep my nose to the grindstone, it looks like I'm probably going to have to pull in the motor, which is a new experience for me. Thought maybe Gen 3 Hemi, but not looking too promising at this point. But anyways, you were talking on the podcast about getting motivated to work on your projects, and I know just kind of listening to this kind of motivated me to get back in the garage. So not just talking a big game or, you know, dreaming about the future, but actually making stuff happen. So I want to say thanks for that. Also, all this, all this talk about vans recently. I was watching a movie not too long ago. Um, that one popped up from movie old school. Gosh, I mean, that, that's a great movie if anybody's never seen it. But uh, that scene from Rush Week where they got the Metallica going, they're just kind of grabbing their guys off the street. That uh, was pretty good. Um, looks like a 4 by 4 80 van. I didn't know that was really a thing. I didn't know if you knew more about that, but the black and the craters and the side pipes, uh, pretty badass. I mean, I always like when these Mopars pop up in movies. Probably know more about that than anybody I know, but then again, none of my friends really give a rip about movies or Mopars, but maybe I just need to find new friends, but... Anyways, I uh, hope all's going well where you're at. Um, just keep up the awesome work, and we'll hopefully tune into one of the live streams here in the future. Have a good one. Grant, I bet you weren't expecting to be on a live stream. <laughs> uh, yeah, I vaguely remember the van you're talking about. Um, I'm going to have to watch that movie now and uh, check it out and see. Cause I'm trying to remember the scene you're talking I re I remember the scene. I don't remember the van. But as far as 4 by 4 vans, yeah, that was a thing. <laughs> some of these vans are really badass. Some of these four by four vans. Um, gosh, what was that show? Um, Dirt Every Day. 
they had a Dodge 4x4 van that they took on, what's that event where you buy the cheap cars and you go on like a, not a scavenger hunt, but a, uh, damn it. Gambler 500. <laughs> Gambler 500. Uh, they took this 4x4 van on the Gambler 500. And it was a pretty fun episode. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, let's see what we got in the chat here. Braden. Uh, yeah, I'm going to reach out to Proform and talk to him. Um, Braden says that uh, they've got a lot of good products and parts. Um, carbs, I, didn't, I don't know very much about the company. At first, I thought they were just like an accessory company. But just doing a little surface digging, I saw that they're involved in a lot more than that. So Braden says they got good carbs and uh, carbs that pack a punch and roller rockers. So um, I'll have to uh, I'll have to look into Proform a little bit more close um, and their official licensed Mopar products, which is always a good thing. Uh, and yeah, Tad Tad's a pretty cool guy. Um, from what I I mean, I've never met the guy. I've only listened to him on my show and uh every one of his messages is entertaining to me I, I think i think they're great so tad keep them coming buddy um you might just get your own segment on the show <laughs> tad talk <laughs> tad talk uh, sometimes i get these little <laughs> these stupid little you know ted talks and tad talks <laughs> on talking mopars that's funny um derek says uh will trade running 318 for talking mopar sweatshirt i do this is live so this was not planned folks but i do keep merch around you can get t-shirts hoodies and various other products i even have a uh mostly for myself i have a it's not like a face mask but it's like one of those um gosh what do you call them I can't think of the word right now, but almost like a bandana or whatever that goes around your neck for the stupid masks and you can just pull it up. Um, it's made of a really nice lightweight material. Uh, it says talking Mopars. It's got the logo with the super, the orange super bird on Craigers that I made. Um, it's got that on there and it says talking Mopars podcast. It's pretty rad. Um, but you can find all the products that I sell uh, at talkingmopars.com under the official merch tab. Um, we got Talking Mopars merch, and the proceeds from those help me keep the wheels running on this podcast. Um, you know, it's actually not, believe it or not, it's not cheap to run at, what was that? Yes, Net Gator. Thank you, Brandon. A Net Gator. Um, yeah, so uh, I have cool Net Gators. Um, more are going to be coming. I'm going to get one made that says no Mopar left behind. Uh because I don't expect everybody to be walking around with a net gator that says Talking Mopar's podcast. I'm just that type of jerk that would wear one <laughs> with my own podcast name on it. Uh, but the when you buy products from me and Talking Mopar's t-shirts or whatever, we got stickers too. Uh, it basically helps me keep the wheels running because you know doing these lives, the um, platform that I use costs me money per month. The platform I use to host my podcast costs me money. The website costs me money. <laughs> you know, it like the list goes on. So if I didn't have any money coming in from t-shirts, I would be funding this all on my own because nobody pays me for this. Um, I really have, aside from the few merch sales that I have, because I, I don't, I am not going to get rich off this thing. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, I've definitely spent more than I've made. Um, and this isn't a, please buy my stuff. It's a, if, if you like my show and you like what I do on Talking Mopars, you like what I do on the Mopar Hunter, and you feel like supporting the No Mopar Left Behind movement, grab a t-shirt. Um, there's going to be more coming, I promise. I've just been, I've got my, my claws into everything, and um, I'm starting to get more organized again. Every once in a while, I go off the rails and I get unorganized, and that always screws me over. So I'm really working on uh, tightening the ship. And in that comes more products that I think you guys will like. And one of my ideas was to start hiring out designs. So I was going to go find the best designers that I could and each month have a new t-shirt come out. Um, 
I thought that would be fun, but you wouldn't believe, and I take that back, you would believe how much some of these very talented designers charge for t-shirt designs. Um, one of them, and I, I won't put them on blast because their artwork is super quality and I would pay them in a heartbeat if I had enough money to throw around like that. But one, one designer I talked to, gosh, it's been a year or two now, um, for one t-shirt design, of course, I would have the exclusive rights to it, but it was $500. <laughs> the amount of money I make per t-shirt, I would have to sell like 500 t-shirts to even make it worth my time. You know what I mean? And that's an investment because it takes a long time to push that many t-shirts. I'll tell you that. Uh, so I'm still looking, I'm actually looking more at amateur artists right now because they're trying to get their work out there and get their name out there and I can afford some of their work. So that's something to look forward to as far as merch goes, because I don't want all my merch to just say talking Mopar's podcast. I have a lot of cool designs that I've done myself that are just cars that I think are cool. And I think, um, I think listeners like you guys, people that watch the show, people that listen to the show would like to wear. Uh, Cause anytime I'm out and about and I see somebody with a Mopar shirt or a Mopar jacket, I got to say something, you know, Hey, you know, it's one of our own, <laughs> you know what I mean? Us Mopar people, we got to stick together. All right. Um, so yeah, if you, if you want to support what I do, you can go to talkingmopars.com and grab some merch. Or if I've been talking about this for a little bit um, on Facebook, I have a subscription platform. Now I need to start really cranking out content for that. Um, it's $4.99 a month which breaks down to like $1.25 a week. So it's really nothing. Um, and the plan is to put out bonus podcasts on that and other various content, because I give a lot of stuff out for free, including the podcast. And I thought for the people that, you know, want to support in a different way, I, I, I don't like ask, I, I like giving something in return for, you know, your, your patronage, you know? That's why I sell merch because you're not just giving me, you know, 20 bucks or whatever. You're getting something out of it, you know, something you can enjoy. And I thought if I had a subscription platform, you know, five bucks a month that I could provide more content than I normally do on just the podcast and just the Mopar Hunter. So I'm still working on that. I do. One cool thing about it is every month I give something away like this last month or for this month, excuse me. Um, I'm having a banner printed that says uh, no Mopar left behind. And it's a garage banner. It's probably going to be about three feet long and yay tall. So it'd be really cool in somebody's uh, in somebody's garage or shop. Um, so if you're part, if you pay that $4.99 a month, you'll at least be entered into a raffle to win something cool. And as I get more money rolling in, the prizes will get better. I promise you that. Uh, so definitely look forward to that. Um, and I don't expect anybody, you know, I'm not going to beg anybody to become a, uh, subscriber to what I do. You know what I mean? The people that want to support me in that way, uh, uh, thank you. And I promise there's going to be some cool stuff hitting that, um, very soon. Um, a lot of the van content that I do is going to be on that platform. Um, not all of it, but quite a bit of it. Um, just because I, I got to give you something for $4.99 a month. I got to give you something more than I give you now. And, you know, a lot of it, I think, um, it is people that just want to help support me and help me out, you know, and I appreciate that. A lot of them are my friends, <laughs> you know, so to all of you that support me on Facebook fan subscriptions, thank you. And it's actually an experiment. If it doesn't work out, then I'll have to, I'll have to figure something else out. But so far it's, it's okay. It's doing all right. And I'm excited to add more content to that more bonus content. So moving on, gosh, we've been going almost an hour and 20 minutes. I can just talk forever. <laughs> uh, so today, it's Thursday. I went into work with every intention, with every fiber in my being to get the day off. And the way my work uh, operates is that we all have routes. I'm a garbage man, for those of you that don't know. Um, and we have 
a list of extra drivers that don't have routes and most of them are new drivers and if there's enough of them that don't have work for the day you can go hey i'd like to go home you can give one of them my route for the day and they can make some money that's what i did today and the mission was to get the exhaust done on my truck for those of you that don't know it's got glass packs on it now at first i really liked how rowdy it was i was like yeah that's pretty cool and after the novelty of that wore off i ended up <laughs> i ended up getting some exhaust leaks because whoever put the glass packs in didn't weld them they were just clamped on both ends um because it's got true duels and uh I don't know if it was me mashing around in that thing and just having a lot of fun or what, but it was leaking from every clamp <laughs> on the damn thing. So I decided to get some new mufflers. And originally my friend Murray, the guy who built the truck had thrush welded mufflers on it. And that's what I bought. So we'll get into a little bit more of that in a minute, but so, <laughs> This is how it happened. I get the day off, I go get my truck and I'm excited too, because I'm like, oh, I can get this done in the morning and spend the rest of the day with my wife and daughter. Cause my wife's working from home right now and my daughter's still young. Um, so it would be nice to have the day off and get something uh, done on my truck and spend a day with my daughter. Cause I, I work a lot of hours. I work over 50 hours a week. And a lot of the times I come home and put my daughter to bed. So I don't get much time during the week. I get most of my time on the weekends. So I was really looking forward to this. So I had already ordered the mufflers, got them in, threw them in the truck and said, I'm going to go get this exhaust done because I knew of a shop not too far away that took walk-ins. And they told me, if you come in the morning during the week, chances are we'll be able to squeeze you in that same day within a couple hours. So I was like, sweet. <laughs> so on my way, I'm driving and it was kind of a weird morning. I'm hauling ass. So we got this thing called the trestle and it connects basically uh, I-5 to another city, basically, and it goes over the slough. And it's a fun little straight stretch of road or bridge, if you will, to get a little rowdy. So I'm on there and I'm in second gear just hauling. And uh, something told me to just, okay, calm down, dude. So I let off and the thing was, it had a leaky exhaust and it's glass packs. So the thing, was roaring. <laughs> I let off and I see a Washington State Patrol car on the little, um, there's like a little uh, section of road that they can hide in basically as you drive past. And I, I saw the roof of his Ford Explorer and I was like, oh shit. <laughs> so I slowed down. Uh, he must not have had his gun out because I was, by the time I was probably noticeable, I was probably down to about 70, 65, 70 miles an hour. But he didn't pull me over, thank God. So I'm like, oh, phew. Like, no worries there. Cool guy just cruising. I get on I-5. And all of a sudden, I start hearing this noise. <laughs> Every time I hit a little dip in the road, I heard <sighs> like a scraping sound. And the first thing that came to my mind was the front spoiler. So this truck has a front spoiler that was trimmed, and it's off of a van. It's fiberglass. And not the guy I bought the truck from, but the guy before that had ripped it off on his, on, on his driveway, like pulling into his driveway or pulling out of his driveway or something. So where the mounting points are, he had it JB welded. And my intention has always been to like fix that and make it a little bit better and, you know, shoot some paint on it or whatever and to touch it up. And I, I thought, oh God, I think the spoiler broke and part of it is hanging. And I, I, I was hearing it on the driver's side. So every little, every little dip and bump in the road, I was hearing <laughs> and it started getting worse. And I was like, Oh God. And I was thinking to myself, do I pull over now or do I risk it and get to the next exit? And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm like a mile or two away from the next exit. And, you know, part of me is like, all right, let's haul ass, you know, because the faster you go, hopefully it's just, it starts just skipping the road instead of so harsh when it scrapes. And uh, I make it off the freeway, the whole way it's going, and I'm just like, 
expecting the front spoiler just to, you know, blow up into a million pieces and hit the windshield and hit the truck. And uh, that didn't happen. <laughs> so I pull off the freeway, I pull into the first parking lot uh, that I see, and I get out and I run over to the front. And I'm like, oh, thank God. <laughs> it was not the front spoiler. Thank God. Um, then I started thinking, okay, it's definitely a suspension component. And the first things that came to my mind were the strut or, you know, uh, there's a number of things it could be. But for some reason, it, it just dawned on me that it was probably the strut because I've had a similar situation happen to a car in the past, except for my control arm came loose and the wheel popped out like that as I was driving down the road. And it was going, kick, 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 right? Crazy story, not a Mopar story. Um, so I get out and I look under the truck and there's like that much clearance. So you can't see much. The truck's pretty low. And what do I see? I see the yellow strut basically hanging a half inch, maybe, no, it was definitely maybe three quarters of an inch off the ground. And the bottom of it is flat because that's what was hitting. Uh, so I was like, oh, shit. The bolts had came out from the bottom. So I'm like, well, I was going to have the exhaust done anyway, only now I can't go to the shop that I had planned to go to because it's about 20 miles away. Uh, so I thought of a shop that was very close by that I've had work done in the past. Um, and I was like, you know what? Uh, I wonder if they'll do, if they'll weld in these mufflers for me too. So I go over there, I, I limp the truck over there, you know, I'm driving very carefully, but it's still even driving carefully on every little thing. It's, <laughs> it just sounds like garbage. Um, so I, I get up to the, the business that I'm going to. And on their little sign on the street, it says custom exhaust done here or something like that. So I was like, okay, cool. It's like a, a sign. <laughs> I was like, a, literally a sign, but it was like, a, okay, just do it here, dude. You know, cause I, I had thought about just risking it and just driving it the 20 miles. And I was like, Hey idiot, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> so get the truck in there. They're like, yeah, no problem uh while we do the exhaust because i can't weld or at least i haven't welded since high school <laughs> which is something i want to change i definitely want to get back into welding um <laughs> they're like when we get it uh up in the air we'll just throw two bolts in there for you no problem um so i was like all right cool thanks appreciate it no charge <laughs> they get it up in the air and i start taking a look at the suspension because one issue i have with this truck is that if i'm hammering down right? And I let off the throttle. It shimmies to the, I don't even want to call it a shimmy. It's almost a slight pull to the left, but it feels like it's coming from the rear. And I've looked underneath the truck and I didn't notice this surprisingly, but when it was up in the air, it was clear as day. So looking at the truck from the rear, the driver's side U-bolts and springs are a little bit like kitty wampus you know what i mean they're just a little bit off and it, that has to because I, I was under there grabbing stuff seeing if there was anything loose that was the only thing and it's tight which is weird so i'm like did, how did they shift you know so i have a lot of questions about that um i'm gonna have to get under there and uh take a closer look at it because of course they were like well we can take a look at i was like no let's just do the exhaust and throw those bolts in i can take care of everything else because they're just trying to at that point, they're trying to make some more money off me. And I was like, no, I just, I can't weld. That's why I'm here. <laughs> and these two, but I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't even been at that shop if it wasn't for that strut. So they throw two bolts in there and I pull out my mufflers and I was like, these are what I want welded in. And the way they were uh, installed in the first place for clearance was instead of running the mufflers like this, they were turned up like that. Okay. So there was two mufflers originally the original thrush welded were turned up sideways um so that they could be tucked up underneath uh the truck a little bit and we pulled out the mufflers and i i bought the wrong mufflers to make a long story short the thrush uh the thrush mufflers that i bought were offset inlet and outlet and what i needed 
was the same side. So inlet, outlet. And we tried figuring out if we could get, how we could get the fitment to be right. And it would have, it would have been a real pain in the ass. So I was like, well, you know what? I just want to replace the glass packs because down the line, I want to put in a more sophisticated exhaust system, probably with cutouts and stuff. But anyways, so I was like, all right, you know, at that point, I had already come to terms with the fact that the thrush welded mufflers weren't going on the truck. So I'm like, <laughs> it, it dawned on me because I had been thinking about it for a few days. Um, of course, it wasn't, it wasn't until after I ordered those mufflers, but I was like, these are going to quiet the truck down a little bit. And while I don't like the truck being too rowdy, and this is going to sound stupid in a minute, <laughs> while I don't like the truck being too rowdy, I do think that it has a good personality as far as the way it sounds, because, you know, without the exhaust leak, of course, because people have told me that thing sounds nasty. And I'm like, yeah, you know, it does sound pretty good when it's not leaking, <laughs> you know, um, but it is loud. It's crazy loud. And at first I hated it and I hated it up until about a couple days ago, but I kind of like it loud, not exhaust leak loud, but I, I really like hearing that it's nice to have something that just is nasty sounding, you know, here in the cam, you know, that chop, like get to the chopper, you know what I mean? That chop, that cam chop. And it's not a radical cam in the thing. It's got a comp cam 280H. Um, I, I forget what the specs are, but um, nothing too radical. Uh, it's a very nice street cam. And I like the sound of it, especially with the loud exhaust. And I, I didn't want it glass pack loud, but I wanted it loud. At this point, I was like, well, if I'm not going with the thrush welded, that's going to change my plan completely. Um, I'm not going to bother throwing four, 40 series Blowmasters in it. I was like, let's just go for the whole kit and caboodle. Let's throw Super 10s in it. <laughs> and they, they happen to have uh, Super 10s in stock. So I was like, you know what? Screw it. Um, my friend Rich, Chopper Rich, has a uh, Swinger Dart. And he's got Super 10s on his. And I heard it in person. And I liked it. And it was loud and nasty. But at that point, I had already sold myself on quieting the truck down. Um, after thinking about it, and like I said, after order, order, already ordering the exhaust, the mufflers, I changed my mind. And I was like, oh, let's go, let's go rowdy. Let's throw super tens on it. So I actually, instead of the thrush welded, the whole game plan completely changed. And I threw super tens in it today. And it is, <laughs> the thing's got more drone than Obama. <laughs> and I, I try not to make political jokes on the show, <laughs> but the thing, it, it's got some serious drone now, but drone has never, I know a lot of people hate drone, it really doesn't bother me. This is the first vehicle that I've had. And I know some of you can relate because I know you've been driving these loud cars for a long, long time. And some of you like them really loud. And some of you, like myself, enjoy the sound so much, you don't even listen to the radio. I think in total, I've probably had the radio on in this truck maybe for 15 minutes. Every once in a while, I'll pull out my Bluetooth speaker and listen to a podcast or something, maybe some music. But for the most part, I like to just hear the truck. And uh, the drone really didn't bother me that bad. Um, the chop at idle was so nice that I, I could deal with, I, I would be willing to live with any drone that I got until I get a different exhaust system. <laughs> so it's got a little drone, but damn, does this thing sound nasty. Um, I have some footage from both my phone and my GoPro. I haven't edited the GoPro footage yet, but the sound on my phone, it just doesn't do it justice. It just doesn't have, it just doesn't sound right. Um, because there is a certain sound with exhausts, like uh, specifically Flowmasters that I really don't care for. This, I don't think it has it that much. It has it a little bit if you really, you know, rev it up, but just driving around, and idling and even getting after it a little bit, it doesn't have that, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like a real tinny, uh, almost like a popping noise. I, I know what you guys, I know, I know you guys know what I'm talking about. 
It really doesn't have that. Um, maybe a little if you're sitting there and you're just revving it, you get a little bit of it. But just in normal driving, it's just loud. Um, is it obnoxious? I think it is, but it's grown on me, the obnoxiousness of the exhaust of this truck. So uh, I'm going to run the Super 10s for a while. I know Murray, my friend Murray, the guy who built the truck, hated the glass packs because he had a really nice, very expensive custom exhaust built for the truck. Um, and the only expensive part about it was the fabrication because those mufflers, those thrush welded mufflers are a bargain compared to some of the other ones on the market, including the Flowmasters I bought. Uh, but um, I like the way it sounds. I think it sounds nasty and I'm going to ride with it for a while like it is until maybe the Hemi swap or whatever engine I decide to go with down the road, but chances are it's going to be a Hemi. Um, there is a Hemi I'm looking at on Saturday. Uh, I currently, for those of you that don't know, I have a Hemi that I bought for $100 that had a blown head gasket out of an 06 charger. And after doing a partial teardown of the cylinder heads to have them machined, I found out that it was a remanufactured block, which isn't a bad thing, especially if the block's still good. And when I pulled the heads off, there was no, it didn't drop a valve or anything like that. That's pretty common when you overheat these things. Um, it actually looked pretty good on the inside. So I'm hoping that he blew the head gasket, shut her down, and that there's no head warpage or anything like that. But we're going to find out. But this weekend, that, that's an 06 Hemi, which has a little bit less power than the newer ones with the Apache heads. Or the Eagle heads, sorry. Um, the Apaches are on the 6.4s. So... I found an eagle-headed Hemi out of a 2012 Dodge Ram that apparently has a little bit of a knocking noise. And it's it was 800. Then it got down to 600. I offered them five. They said, all right, come take a look at it. So I'm going to go on Saturday take a look at it because ideally I would like the truck to have about four or 500 horsepower. All right, 450 would be really nice. Um, cause it's not really a drag truck, but I want it to have some power. I want it to be somewhat reliable. And I like the idea of having a truck with a Hemi. Um, and I can't afford a second generation Hemi. So the third generation will have to do. So I'm going to go look at that engine, hopefully pick it up this weekend. And when it gets a Hemi, it'll have a very nice exhaust system put on it. So that's why I was kind of like, you know, what? let's throw super tens on it. Let's be uh, obnoxious for a while. <laughs> You know, I'm sure Murray's gonna hate me for that, but sorry, Murray. Um, we're just gonna we're just gonna let it ride. <laughs> but that's that's pretty much the update on the Mr. Norm shop truck. There's a lot of stuff I need to do. I need to do brakes on it. I need to rebuild the front end. Um, I got underneath it and I looked at the patch job on the driver and passenger floor pan, and it's gonna have to be redone. I want it to be cleaner. Uh, and thankfully, they make pretty nice patch panels for those now. So I'm going to I'm going to try to do it right. And then um, the frame annoyed me a little bit. And it only annoyed me because I'm kind of a perfectionist. And I, I think I should sand what I can and paint it uh, and just kind of clean up the frame a little bit. Because um, I, I don't want to neglect it down there, you know. So take care of that kind of stuff. Definitely look at the suspension, um, make sure everything's tight. I'm going to go down there with my impact and just <laughs> zip down anything that I can get uh, a socket on. Um, and like I said, I'm going to rebuild the front end. I'm probably going to put new leaves in the back. I'm just going to, I'm going to get it. <laughs> so you've heard me on the podcast talk in the past about when you buy a project car, uh, check it out for safety. Or if you buy a ratty muscle car, what you want to do is you want to get it running and driving safely. <laughs> and I've been lazy about this truck. And I told myself when I do the exhaust, it'll be up in the air. So I'll be able to inspect it then. Had I not been lazy and just got underneath the thing and did the safety check that I always say to do, I probably would have caught those loose bolts. So lesson learned, I need to heed my own advice and not be a moron. So I learned my lesson there. So we're going to get underneath it and really check everything out and see if we can take care of that little shimmy, shimmy shake that it does. And, um, but other than that, I'm really happy with the truck. I love driving it. 
damn, that truck gets a lot of attention. And I don't mind it because, you know, I'm using it as a promotional vehicle for my podcast. So when people ask me about the truck, I get to promote um, this way. <laughs> I get to promote uh, Mr. Norm and his legacy as a legend amongst legends in uh, the history of Mopar, you know, the high performance heritage of Mopar. Uh, when they ask me about, oh, you know, Mr. Norm's Grand Spalding Dodge, what's that all about? So I can tell them, and they always ask me if it's real. <laughs> I get that from a lot of people online. Um, is it a real Mr. Norm's truck? Uh, here's how I know that people, a lot of them don't know the exact history of Mr. Norm's Grand Spalding Dodge. My truck is a 78 and it's got an earlier grill on it, which I'll give people a pass on this. But technically, Mr. Norm wasn't involved with Grand Spalding Dodge in 78. He had left earlier. So my truck is actually not correct if you really wanted to be a stick. Like if I wanted to pretend like it was and I wanted to be a jerk, you know, and be a be a con artist and say, oh, yeah, it's a real Mr. Norm shop truck. Uh, somebody who knows a lot about the history of Grand Spalding Dodge would be able to call me on my BS. <laughs> so I, I would never do that. I would never present the truck as anything other than a really well done tribute. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a, that's a little secret that I'm sure that a lot of people just didn't take into account. But technically... If it couldn't be a real truck because Mr. Norm's Grand Spalding Dodge didn't exist as Mr. Norm's Grand Spalding Dodge at the time. So anyways, that's the update on the Mr. Norm shop truck. Really excited to go cruising. I guess our governor, our crappy governor, um, put us in phase three. So hope, hopefully a lot of my favorite car events will not be canceled this year. Speaking of events, Myself and a few of my Mopar buddies will be attending Mo Party in Bowling Green, Kentucky in September. That's the event that Holly's been putting on. Or it, the first Mo Party was last year. I didn't make it and I wanted to because I wanted to podcast live from it. And I was hoping to get there because there was one person, there was one person I really wanted to talk to. And it was Mr. Norm. I've never met the guy. Now I'll never meet him. But I know he was there. And he actually got on Rob Kibbe's podcast. And Rob, if you ever listen to this, this is not meant as an insult to you. I should have been the guy to interview Mr. Norm. Because this is talking Mopars. You know, Rob has a, a good podcast called The Muscle Car Place. But this is talking Mopars. Mr. Norm should have been on talking Mopars. And I will never forgive myself for not getting to that show and having the best possible interview on a podcast with Mr. Norm that was possible. Because I've done shows on Mr. Norm before. I've been a fan of Mr. Norm for years. Um, that's one reason why I love this truck so much. The first time I saw it, I was like, holy, is that a Mr. Norm shop truck? And even I didn't take into a count when I first saw the truck that the timeline for the truck doesn't make sense but at the time I saw it, it also had a 72 or 73 grill on it so that it could get into good guys because at the time they had a year cut off so I would have had to you know look at the VIN number and go oh, this isn't this isn't a real 72 it's actually a 78 so this couldn't be a real Mr. Norm's truck or whatever but um yeah that's uh that's something that uh, it's going to be tough for me to swallow because I tried to get Mr. Norm on the podcast twice, but he's a busy guy, you know, and he was getting up there in age. So I didn't expect him to jump at the opportunity to go, oh, a podcast that only a few thousand people listen to. <laughs> yeah, I'll jump on it. Um, I wasn't uh, expecting him to, you know, leap at the opportunity. So it was my mission to get the podcast as popular as I could. And then at least approach him with something that could be worthwhile because I could help him promote, you know, his memorabilia page and, you know, the other businesses that he's involved with. But uh, I didn't get that chance. I'm not going to get that chance. And I should have been at that show and I should have been the podcast to interview Mr. Norm. And that will, that'll haunt me for a long time. But I do have the tribute truck and I have nothing but good things to say about Mr. Norm. That's why I collect 
<laughs> I collect the memorabilia, you know. Um, he's just such a figurehead in the high performance heritage of Mopar. But rest in peace, Mr. Norm, moving on. Uh, that was the update on the project truck. I see we're almost at two hours and I wanted to talk about built versus bought. And the reason why I wanna talk about building a Mopar versus buying one either close to done in running and driving project car condition or completely done is because the Mr. Norm truck, while it's not done, it is a running and driving project. And I got it because I sold the projects that were dead in the water that I had. So it got me thinking, and I've seen the argument on social media, you know, oh, you know, the guys that buy their cars, you know, are, are basically they're losers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I disagree, not just because I have a car that somebody else put a lot of time and effort into or a truck, but because everybody's situation is different, you know what I mean? And ideally, what I would love to have is my truck that runs and drives and is still a project and a full-blown project. I just don't have the space, the time, or the money right now to make that happen. I'll probably never have the time, but space and money are things that I have more control over. So that would be my ideal situation instead of the way it was before where I had two full-blown projects. Um, Speaking of which, Will, the guy who bought my truck, is making some killer progress on that thing. I'm so happy I sold it to him. Um, it's definitely in the right hands. But uh, I, I, like I said, I see that argument. You know, oh, build your car. Don't buy it done. Like, I don't know where these people think they get off saying that because it's like, no, I get it. And I have the utmost respect for people that build cars from the ground up or take a project that has, you know, it's a shell and they do all the work themselves. They get it running and driving. They paint it. You know what I mean? It's a beautiful car. Hey, my hat's off to you. Uh, you have the skills, the time, the money to do something like that. Not everybody has those things. So to judge somebody for buying, you know, a car that's already done versus building it, it's like, you know how much money he probably saved buying that $40,000 Roadrunner, he buys a, a, Joe Blow buys a 1969 Plymouth Roadrunner for $40,000. It runs and drives and it is maybe not show winning quality, but it's quality enough where you can take it to a show and be proud of it, <laughs> you know, um, versus the guy who buys a Roadrunner shell for $5,000 and has to sink tens of thousands of dollars in it to get it roadworthy. Two different situations. The guy who built the car from the ground up, basically, utmost respect. You're amazing. You're you're a craftsman. <laughs> you know, you're very knowledgeable and you did a great job. The guy who bought it, who bought a Roadrunner done, uh, you saved a lot of time and money and you got to enjoy that car immediately. Because guess what? Tomorrow is not guaranteed, people. You know, um, I kept thinking about that when I had my projects. I was like, gosh, I may never finish these. And at the end of things, what does that even mean? I had two projects that sat there. I'm leaving behind Mopars. <laughs> you know, no Mopar left behind. Duh. You know what I mean? So that's why I cut them loose. That's why I bought something that was running and driving so that I could at least enjoy it. And it's a promotional vehicle for what I do. So, I mean, that's my reasoning by uh, getting something that was partially built by somebody else and then taking it to that next level. I enjoy buying projects that are unfinished or that you can take to the next level. I think it's fun um, because some people's visions are really simpatico with your own. Like when I saw the Mr. Norm's truck, I loved it. I was like, I couldn't have built a tribute truck better. Like in my mind, like the way it looks, like I couldn't have imagined something that cool. In fact, when I was, when I had my blue truck, I was going to not copy, but I was going to mimic the style, um, obviously with my own logo, my own fonts and stuff like that. But I was going to do a shop truck for talking Mopars. Um, but like I said in the last podcast, uh, that truck just, there's something about that truck where no other truck in my mind holds a candle to it as far as concept. 
the Mr. Norm shop truck tribute is awesome. So my opinion on built versus bought, it all depends on your situation. There's pros and cons to each. A full-blown project, con number one, money. <laughs> it's not going to be cheap. Even if you did all the labor yourself, you still have to buy the parts. Time, that's another huge con. Uh, and I, it's tough calling it a con because that time spent in the garage is always good. I have a good time in the garage. So, you know, can you really call it a con? I don't know. That's, that's um, debatable. But uh, maybe you don't have a lot of time. That's where, if you're looking at the difference, you're going to go, I don't have that much time. So that's a con for a full-blown project. If somebody came up to me and asked me today, Chris, should I buy a full-blown project or should I buy one that's running and driving? Whether it be show quality or uh, running and driving a driver quality car. I would look them in the eye and I would say, do you want to have fun now or five years from now? <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, and that's just generally. Um, but if you're like me, an impulsive person who is really starting to think about right now and living in the moment, then I would say make a little bit of an investment and buy something that you can drive and have fun with. And then once you have that, like my situation, I have a truck that I can drive and enjoy while I work on it. If I got another project that was more intense, I don't ever have to feel like I'm missing out because I have something I can enjoy while I work on the other one. So that's my opinion on built versus bought. And that was talking Mopars, folks. Uh, we're going on two hours here. I didn't think that I was going to make it a half an hour, but somehow I managed to talk your ears off again. Let's run through this chat really quick and uh, close her out. Um, <laughs> Derek, yes, join the Mopar Hunters Association. And what's funny about that is on <laughs> when I look at uh, the Mopar Hunters Association on Facebook, it actually abbreviates it. <laughs> and I'm not joking. I'll have to screenshot this. It's hilarious. I saw it the other day. It says Mopar Hunters ass. And I'm like, of course it does. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, damn it. <laughs> That's my own fault. So now when I look at it, uh, I forget what screen it is, but when I'm looking at it, it says Mopar Hunter's ass. And I'm like, oh, yeah, classy, Chris. Good job. <laughs> um, Brandon says, I just found you and love the no Mopar left behind idea. I will share my off the wall Mopar to your page. Thank you, Brandon. I look forward to it. No Mopar left behind is a universal idea of, you know, they're, there are still cars out there that can be saved and we should not let them get crushed. Um, funny coming from a guy who let two projects sit for so long, but I'll tell you what, I made sure they went to good people that had every intention of bringing them back to their proper form. So I feel good in the fact that I may have held on to them for a long time and longer than I probably should have. But when I did get rid of them, I made sure they went to the right people. So I can, I can, I can live with that. But, the Mr. the Mr. Norm shop truck tribute, that was going to get painted. The Mr. Norm tribute truck was not going to exist had I not bought it. So in a way, I saved the truck. And, you know, an unfortunate coincidence is that, you know, we lost Mr. Norm shortly thereafter. Shortly after I bought the truck, Mr. Norm passed away. So the timing, I mean, crazy timing. Uh, but... Yeah, no Mopar left behind. That's my slogan. That's my saying. Uh, I have it on t-shirts, talkingmopars.com. Go pick yourself up one. No Mopar left behind. Um, but yeah, I, I always, I like the way it sounds. And it's a fun hashtag. I wish more people used it. Tim Smith, meet the son equals meet the father. Um, I have been talking to Lee, also known as Norm Jr. I've been talking to Lee. He's a busy guy right now, obviously. So when things calm down, hopefully I can get this tribute show organized and get the right people involved. And hopefully we can get some messages rolling in. I still haven't, honestly, I haven't gotten any messages. Um, I need to check my emails. Nobody's, I don't, everybody loves Mr. Norm. Call and say, hey, Mr. Norm, thank you. It's a tribute. 
you don't have to tell me some crazy long story. You know, if, if, if I was in a listener's shoes right now or one of your shoes right now, and I was listening to me say, hey, call the number and either tell me a story about Mr. Norm, an interaction that you've had, or say some nice words. Me right now, uh, I never got to meet Mr. Norm. I never got to talk to him. But without him, uh, let's pretend I called right now. Mr. Norm, thank you so much for your contribution to the Mopar community. Without you and your willingness to break down walls and run over obstacles, we would have never had a big block dart, or at least it would have taken a lot longer. Because in 1967, you had the balls <laughs> to do what Chrysler couldn't do and shoehorn a 383 in a Dodge Dart. And you also had the ginormous fortitude to drive it to Chrysler and say, look what we did. <laughs> and without you, I mean, you're probably the biggest figurehead in Chrysler history alongside, like part of the Mount Rushmore of Mopars. You know, you've got people like Mr. Norm, Tom Hoover, Jack Smith, Sox and Martin, Dick Landy, uh, Don Garlitz, you know, and the list goes, I mean, the Mount Rushmore would have to be pretty big when it comes to Mopars, but Mr. Norm is right up there. And thank you for your contribution. That's all the message has to be. If, you could even call him to say, hey, thanks, Mr. Norm, huge fan. <laughs> That's all it has to be. I just want to get people to, you know, let their voice be heard, you know, say something nice about Mr. Norm. So hopefully, uh, hopefully I get some messages. If not, worst case scenario, and this is not a bad case at all, I just get people that knew Mr. Norm on the show to tell their stories about him. I think that's the best thing I could do. And it would just be nice to hear other people um, share and chime in. But for everything you need to know about the show and where to listen and to find the merch, you can visit talkingmopars.com. Special thanks to my friends, Johnny Mopar, he's got a YouTube channel. Go to YouTube and look up Johnny Mopar. He's got something really cool going on. He may be racing Dave Freiberger in General Mayhem. Because for those of you that don't know, you can go find my original podcasts with Johnny Mopar when I interviewed him or when we, when we talked Mopars. He's the original owner of General Mayhem. Um, not like he didn't buy it brand new, but he's the guy who Dave Freiberger traded the Mopar cylinder heads for the Charger. <laughs> so uh, for those of you that don't, that don't know, Johnny Mopar is the original owner of General Mayhem. So that's really cool. And they've got a little deal going on. And I think we're going to see a race between Johnny Mopar and Dave Freiberger. So General Mayhem versus Johnny Mopar. And of course, I'm rooting for Johnny Mopar. I've been telling him to throw uh, nitrous at whatever engine he throws in it. I think he's putting a 440 in the in the charger. I said, just throw a bunch of nitrous at it and let her rip. <laughs> you know, hashtag buy burger. You know what I mean? I want to see Johnny win that race. If the race happens, I'm rooting for it. I wish I could be the arm drop guy. <laughs> you know, the JJ DeVos of <laughs> that race. I think that would be amazing. So if anybody out there that's listening to this has connections with Motor Trend, Tell them, hey, Chris from Talking Mopars wants to arm drop that race, and I will gladly do it free of charge. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, Johnny Mopar on YouTube. Um, he's also on Facebook. My friend Matt Monroe from Mad Fro Monroe on Big Blocks Garage. That's a podcast. He's a good friend of mine, and he's out there hustling. He's going to have a series of podcasts about A Body Mopars, and those should be really fun. I look forward to it. Like I've said in the past, I wish there were more Mopar podcasts. I would listen to them. <laughs> you know what I mean? So go listen to Matt's podcast. It's a good one. And I endorse it. Then we have my friend Blake from DIYHemi.com. If you have a classic Mopar and you've thought about putting a modern Mopar Hemi in it, a Gen 3 Hemi 
in your classic Mopar, go to DIYHemi.com and take a look at what Blake has to offer for that engine swap. He's made a lot of strides when it comes to wiring and uh, he's got a YouTube channel. It's got great information, um, you know, guides to the swap, like everything you need to know. And plus, Blake is a great guy. You can always reach out to him via email or give him a call. And, you know, he's busy though. So don't blow him up too much. But, you know, he, he'll get back to you eventually. And he's so knowledgeable. That guy, I tell you, um, half the time he talks, <laughs> I listen and pretend like I know what he's saying. And I'm just like, oh yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> uh, he's so smart. The guy's an engineer. And who do you want working on swap components for your Gen 3 Hemi swap in your classic Mopar? You want an engineer doing it. <laughs> so talk to my friend Blake Anderman about your DIY Hemi swap that you want to do. Maybe you go to the wrecking yard and you find a 5.7 liter Hemi in an 06 charger. And you're like, Gosh, that would be really cool in my 67 Belvedere. <laughs> Johnny, Johnny, Blake is the guy to see for that. Um, so Johnny Mopar, Matt Monroe from the Matt Pro Monroe and Big Blocks Garage podcast, Blake Anderman from DIY Hemi, my friend Braden from 66 Salvage Restorations. Um, he's got a Facebook page. Go follow him. Uh, so yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I am super tired. I got to get up at what time is it? What time is it right now? 11.50. I got to get up in four hours <laughs> to work. So I'm getting loopy. I've been loopy for about an hour. So we're going to go ahead and call it right here. There you have it, my friends. Another episode of Talking Mopars is in the books. I apologize for the audio. I did a bonehead move. And instead of recording through this wonderful microphone I'm using right now, all the audio for that podcast was recorded through the webcam. I apologize, but hey, if you made it this far, then you listen to the podcast. So, awesome. <laughs> Give yourself a pat on the back for making it through that. That's it, my friends. We'll see you next week. I am your host, Chris Albrecht, and that was Talking Mopars Live. Thank you for listening to Talking Mopars, your direct connection to all things Mopar. Until next time, remember, no Mopar left behind.